from Kona to Yanan, the political memoirs of Koji Ariyoshi. Chapter 14, Changing Relationship. Early in 1945, our observer section commander, Colonel David Barrett, was removed. Hurley considered that he was too friendly with the communists. With changing times since then, in the post-war Cold War environment, Colonel Barrett became the chief of the anti-communist espionage ring in China. The Peking government caught some of his agents and exposed his activities about a year ago. General Albert Wedemeyer sent Colonel de Pass to Yan'an. Our new commander called us together as soon as he arrived and briefed us that we were not to have any dealings with the Yan'an group. He read us an order from General Wedemeyer, restricting us from discussing hypothetical aid or employment of U.S. resources to assist any effort of any unapproved political party, activity, or persons. The Yan'an officials heard about this, found American pilots were being rescued by the communist-led forces, and Yan'an's liaison officers told us that this order would not stop them from saving our pilots shot down behind enemy lines. The U.S. weather unit, with communist field observers, was providing weather information for U.S. bombing operations in North China and in Japan. Weather in Asia moves from inland to the coast and thus our Air Force had weather information days in advance. When Wedemeyer's order was read to us, I thought that we were going to close our military mission in Yan'an. I began winding up my work. Colonel de Pass carried out the spirit of General Wedemeyer's order to the letter. He spent almost all his time pheasant hunting. Since the war was still going on full blast, we collected intelligence on the Japanese, worked with the communists on the rescue of the pilots, and gathered weather information. We also had some of our observers out in guerrilla bases behind enemy lines. One day news reached Yan'an that an American intelligence officer and his Chinese 18th Group Army interpreter had been killed in a Japanese attack at a guerrilla front. The American had gone to salvage intelligence material from a train the guerrillas had derailed. In Yan'an, the communists proposed a joint funeral for the two who had died on a dangerous mission. Colonel de Pass rejected this proposal. He told the Yan'an officials to go ahead and hold their service, and we would hold ours separately. Besides his hunting rifle, the colonel brought to Yan on a big supply of contraceptives. He told us that we were in an outpost without a U.S. medical officer and for this reason we ought not to take a chance. He said he had an ample supply of contraceptives and he was turning them over to an 18th Group Army liaison officer who was also a doctor. Don't fail to use the contraceptives, he warned, especially in isolated Yan'an. A liaison officer asked a GI, are you now going to import prostitutes into Yan'an? The news got around that Colonel de Pass had brought us contraceptives, and in a place where there was no prostitution, the people had a good laugh. The change in our policy after General Wedemeyer and Hurley replaced General Joseph Stilwell and Ambassador Clarence Gauss, respectively, caught some American observers with the guerrillas unawares. Captain Brooks Dolan had left Yan'an for the Shansi Chahar Hope border region months before Hurley arrived in Yan'an. His Chinese interpreter told me the following story about a year later. Early one morning Dolan was resting in a peasant's hut with a guerrilla unit when the Japanese attacked. The guerrillas, who had extensive underground tunnels, in some areas connecting several villages, hid in a cave under the hut. The Japanese walked overhead. The Chinese commander's wife had a child with her and she hushed him when he began to cry. When the Japanese left in Dolan and the Chinese came out of the tunnel, which was a shallow one, the commander's wife held a dead child in her arms. She had smothered him to death rather than expose Dolan and his guards. Before Dolan left the area, he gave a stirring speech, and not knowing of Hurley's about face or Wedemeyer's orders, he believed we were still striving for a coordinated attack against Japan. He told the Chinese soldiers and peasants behind enemy lines that there was no need to dig any more tunnels. He said the Americans were soon going to land on the coast of Shantun and we would fight with the guerrillas. When Dolan returned to Yan'an and saw the strained relationship between the U.S. observers and the Chinese, he was extremely depressed. He later committed suicide in Chongqing. Some said he had personal problems, and others said his experiences in North China, tied in with American policy, had a lot to do with his mental state. Whenever I flew out of Yan'an in 1945 and 1946 to report to superiors in Chongqing and Shanghai, my Chinese friends at the OWI would warn me that I was being watched by the Tai Lai secret agents. But my fellow workers would ask me about the conditions in North China, and when I talked to them, it seemed that what I said only confirmed what they felt to be true. They were disgusted with Chan's regime. Among the Chinese families persecuted by Chan, I believe the Liao family is outstanding. I met Cynthia through Kajiwataru, the anti-Japanese militarist writer, in Chongqing. A few of us Niseijias were invited to Cynthia's home, a small bamboo shack with walls covered with mud and whitewashed, like most houses in the nationalist wartime capital. 
Cynthia was young in spirit but looked much older than she actually was. She lived very simply and frugally with her adolescent daughter. She spoke Chinese, Japanese, and English. Her American-born father, Lyo Chung Kai, had been one of the leading figures in China during the first quarter of this century. He had been one of Dr. Sun Yat-sen's associates, going into exile in Japan with Dr. Sun, where Cynthia learned her Japanese. After Dr. Sun's death, Lyo became a top leader of the Kuomintang. It was Lyo who had recommended to Dr. Sun that Chang be made president of the Wampoa Military Academy, and later, it was the Wampoa clique which played a vital role in helping Chang into the driver's seat. When Chang once dismissed cadets at the academy, sent them home and went to Shanghai to enjoy its good life, it was Lyo who called back the cadets. He then persuaded Chang to return. Wampoa was then essential in training military leaders for the northern expedition of the mid-twenties to crush the warlords. Had Lyo put someone else in Chang's place, Cynthia told me, Chang's star might never have risen in China. Lyo was assassinated by his political enemies shortly after Dr. Sun's death in 1924. Chang had never liked the Lyo family, according to Cynthia. After Cynthia's brother and husband were arrested by Chang's secret police in the early 30s, her mother, who is an eminent woman leader along with Madame Sun Yat-sen, reminded Chang that he owed his present position to Lyo. In a strongly worded letter, she asked Chang whether he hated Lyo's family to the extent of exterminating it. Cynthia loved to tell the story about her mother sending her skirt to Chang in the early 30s, when the Generalissimo appeased Japanese aggression. Madame Lyo, who regarded Chang as her junior in the Kuomintang at that time, because he was relatively a newcomer compared to her, wrote him, if you don't want to fight the Japanese, let's change uniforms. She told Chang that her skirt would be the coming on him. When I saw Cynthia the first time, her brother was still in a nationalist concentration camp. Her husband had died a few months before. It was said that he was killed accidentally by a nationalist soldier. I did not know that Cynthia was Madame Sun Yat-sen's secretary. Through her I met Madame Sun, whose residence was set far in from the road I walked to and from work at the OWI office. Her neighborhood had a common touch, with chickens and children running around. There were nationalist guards around her house all the time, unwelcome guards placed there by the Chiang regime to watch her and her visitors. Under such a condition, liberal Chinese friends of hers evidently found it unsafe to visit her. Madame Chang is her sister, and Chang her brother-in-law. Chang's regime tried to isolate her, for she is the widow of Dr. Sun and a symbol that encouraged the people to strive for independence and social progress. Madame Sun carried on the unfinished work of Dr. Sun who put forth the slogan, Land to the Tillers. Under the repressive Kuomintang regime, Madame Sun continued with civil liberties struggles and relief work. For 20 years, she was persecuted by her own sisters and in-laws. Today she is the head of the China Welfare Institute, the largest organization of its kind in People's China. The principles of Dr. Sun become realized and grow further in her work. Madame Sun is an inspiration to the common people of China, and for that reason she was isolated by the Chiangs and other relatives who sat on the peasants like parasites, squeezing them and leaving them poor, illiterate, sick and unhappy. Once, in the late twenties, Madame Sun fled China when Chiang attacked the communists, and liberals who wanted to rid China of foreign imperialism and institute land reform. I heard from old-timers in China that Madame Sun was constantly under pressure from her relatives to come to their side. She remained loyal to the people. When I went to visit Madame Sun, I walked past the guards in front of the house, and her maid was standing inside the gate to welcome me. I waited a while in a neatly furnished room and saw Madame Sun come in. I sensed the warmth of her personality as she kept conversation flowing, for she had many questions in her mind. She asked me about the people in the rural areas and of the medical supplies, but she seemed most interested in the Nisei during our conversation. She knew a great deal about the evacuation and about the Ajaya 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Combat Team. She was proud of the Nisei role in the War of Liberation, as she called it. She said it was remarkable that my people were coming through the evacuation experiences with dignity and new strength. Ralph Suess, who wrote Shark's Fins and Millet, told of the popular saying among the poor in China, that of the three Soong sisters, one loves money, one loves power, and one loves China. Madame Sun loves China, and I saw, during my travels in the rural hinterland during the difficult war years when supplies were short, how her efforts brought medical supplies and instruments to the people who needed them most. Su's book described Madame Chang in a very understandable manner. Madame Chang knew as much of democracy as she could see by looking out of windows of Wellesley. On her return home, the young graduate had been shocked by the backwardness of her countrymen as compared with Western civilization symbolized by flush toilets, clean fingernails, decent table manners, and careful grooming. She shrank from the poverty and filth of the Chinese populace then, and she never overcame that feeling. When Madame Chiang Kai-shek stayed here, in Honolulu, briefly recently, a great fuss was made about accommodations for her. 
the first lady of Formosa, whose regime was being subsidized by the Washington administration, came and left for San Francisco with a coterie of servants and attendants. This is a normal and accepted way of living for the lady from Formosa. Mrs. Elena Roosevelt writes in her autobiography that when FDR was alive and president of this country, the madam asked her how it was possible for her to travel alone when she herself had forty to help her and still needed more, who answered her telephone, who packed her bags, who looked after the mail, where were her bodyguards? As the wife of the ruler of Formosa, a small island where the people are poor and taxed highly, one would expect that she would exercise frugality. The big show she puts on whenever she travels to this country rankles numerous U.S. taxpayers who foot Chiang Kai-shek's bills. It was during the last war that Madame Chiang rose as the high priestess of Kuomintang propaganda. She was assisted by Lin Yutan. They created the fiction of Kuomintang resistance against the Japanese when Chang's forces were lying down, waiting for the U.S. to defeat the Japanese aggressors, and begging for money and support from Washington to train an army for a civil war to crush all opposition after the Pacific War. I still remember quite vividly the circus and carnival the Chinese nationalist government made of a Japanese prisoner of war camp in Kuname. I was astonished by the spectacle I saw in May 1945, for while I was familiar with the capability of the nationalists to abuse prisoners, I never expected to see inhuman acts committed by Chinese troops being trained and supervised by American forces at Kuname. I was then visiting my psychological warfare team, which had moved its headquarters from Chongqing to Kuneming during my long absence as a U.S. Army observer in the liberated and guerrilla areas of North China. Kuneming was more strategic for our purpose, since leaflets could be loaded directly on aircraft going to an enemy target area. On that morning I had in mind a series of interviews with the Japanese POWs to find out about enemy morale on the North Burma front, and details as to the living conditions and attitude of the enemy troops to their superiors to the natives and to Chinese nationalist soldiers. I turned off the main highway and got on a trail. To my surprise, I found hundreds of civilian Chinese either going or coming from the POW compound. Some stopped to buy cakes, candies and colored sweetened water from small stands that lined the roadside. A carnival atmosphere prevailed and as I approached the compound, which was roped off, with tents pitched inside the enclosure, I found the visitors were having a grand time. Inside a large tent with its flaps open, I saw about twenty women, most of whom were sitting in a circle, one behind the other, picking lice from each other's heads. They were ill-clad in tattered clothing, filthy and brown with dirt. I talked to a Chinese nationalist non-commissioned officer and obtained his permission to talk to the Japanese captives. I went into the large tent. Soon I learned that these were comfort women who traveled with troops or visited garrisons. They not only entertained troops in order to make life more bearable for them in a foreign country in a war of aggression, but were also prostitutes. Two women in their forties were the madams and they talked freely to me, relieved, I suppose, that someone in an American uniform spoke a language understandable to them. The majority of the young women were attractive despite the dirt and rags, and a great many looked like Koreans. So I asked them individually and practically all of them answered they were. Some said they came from the cities and others from the farms. They all spoke Japanese, for Japan had occupied Korea for forty years and forced her language on the populace. Were they entertainers before they left Korea? I asked. A quiet woman in her early twenties sitting on the ground near me said that she and most of the others had been impressed into the comfort service. She said she wanted the war to end so that she could return to her parents in Korea. Outside, hundreds of curious Chinese were craning their necks to get a good view of the women. The women resented their attention. They asked me if there was any way for them to get some straw to sleep on, instead of the cold, hard ground. They wanted water to cleanse themselves. They hadn't had any for weeks. Some of the women were sick because of the abuses they had taken from Japanese troops and later, after capture, from nationalist soldiers and officers. They asked me if they could get medical attention. I was in no position to promise them anything. I walked into another tent occupied by men. When they found that I spoke Japanese they brought two persons who were their leaders. These men said they did not want to go to any nationalist prison camp for after what they had gone through in more than two months of marching from the Saolin River front to Kuname, they said they could expect any conceivable kind of atrocity from the nationalists. They had started the march with more than 200, less than 80 survived. Did they know that the Japanese troops had been merciless and cruel in China? I asked them, perhaps they, themselves, had been forced to heap abuses on the natives in occupied areas, I said. One of the leaders said that they were now prisoners, that they had been disarmed. He said that they wanted to lead a new life. Could I get in touch with Kaji Wataru for them? He asked. I told the Japanese prisoners the truth that hurt. They hung their heads when I informed them that Kaji was not working with prisoners anymore. His psychological warfare project they had heard about in the Japanese army had been stopped years ago by the nationalist government. 
Just at that moment someone rang a bell outside. Then a Chinese officer yelled a command. All the prisoners, including the sick and the crippled, trudged out of their tents. Chinese soldiers rushed into the tents and shoved the slow-moving prisoners with their rifles. Once the prisoners were lined up with the women in the front row, the command was given for them to count off. In Japanese they counted off and the spectators laughed heartily. When the exhibition, especially put on for the spectators, was over, the Japanese and the Korean women returned to their tents, angered at the humiliation and insult. During the two hours I was there the prisoners were called out seven times to go through the same act for new Chinese spectators who kept coming to see their enemies. I asked a Chinese officer if he felt such a show would boost the will of the people to resist the Japanese militarists. He did not think so. I asked him why such a circus was made of prisoners who should be rehabilitated. He told me that they were following orders from higher up. Today, seven years later, when I read news reports that the U.S. command in Korea is using nationalist officers from Formosa to screen prisoners of war at Koj Island and elsewhere, I can well imagine the conduct of Chiang Kai-shek's officers. Their role at Koj has been reported in mainland newspapers. Locally, the dailies censor such information. In Kanaming, we tried to get one or two Japanese prisoners to work for us in psychological warfare, just as we were doing in Burma. The nationalists would not release any to us. I wanted to stay with my Nisei team in Kunming. Half of our original team was still on the Burma front, and those in Burma felt that with operations there coming to an end, their next assignment would be China. They suggested that I stay in Kunming and try to bring the whole team together and have another member of our team assigned to Yan'an in my place. My superiors in Chongqing said that U.S. relationships with Yan'an being very delicate, with the Chinese communists blasting Ambassador Patrick J. Hurley as an insincere mediator between Yan'an and Chongqing, and an imperialist supporting Chiang in his civil war design, we should not switch personnel. I flew back to Yan'an to find the American Yan'an relationship strained to a breaking point. Our Yan'an observer post became a hot spot. High U.S. officers felt that it should not be pulled out, for this might indicate that we were completely behind Chiang in his domestic policies. Some officers of our mission felt that if we pulled out, Chiang might attack Yan'an territory on a big scale and start a civil war before a Japanese defeat, so the overall character of our mission changed. We sensed strongly that we were not welcome in Yan'an for Ambassador Hurley had sided with Chiang when it was Chiang who had refused to negotiate for peaceful settlement of internal Chinese issues. I was surprised to see how some of our officers had hastily reoriented themselves after Hurley had failed in his mediation and had thrown his full support behind Chiang. The officers who had high praise for the Yan'an administration and its anti-Japanese resistance forces only a few weeks before were calling them names in constant arguments with Chinese communist liaison officers. While our officers once had said the Yan'an administration was a lot better than Chiang's regime in Chongqing, they now began needling the Chinese communist liaison officers, and criticism of Yan'an became their pastime. Some of these officers took to drinking, and from morning to night they downed staggering portions of the potent tiger bone wine. One of them acquired a reputation for breaking the most earthen bottles against the walls of his cave after he had drunk the tiger bone. This was the same officer who had told me when I first arrived in Yan'an to save used razor blades and cellophane wrappers from cigarette packages because the Chinese who were fighting the enemy with so little could make good use of them. Coincidentally with this change of attitude toward Yan'an among some officers of our observer division, our officers became rank happy. In our dining room a separate table was set aside for officers and the former practice of enlisted men and officers eating together at a table, following Yan'an's custom, was abolished. I had been commissioned by then and at our officers' table I heard interesting conversations. The Americans argued, for instance, that only in a capitalistic economy can there be democracy. How long has the United States been a capitalist nation? The liaison officers asked, after they agreed on the period, they asked why one-tenth of the U.S. population, consisting of Negroes and ethnic minorities, is Jim Crowed and discriminated against in economic, social, and political fields. They asked about the racist Bilbo and the House Un-American Activities Committee, the Pendergast and Tammany political machines, and the Ku Klux Klan. The officers soon realized that they had better stay off the subject of communism, about which we were all abundantly ignorant. The enlisted men sitting at their nearby tables listened and got a great bang out of the loud arguments that went on every day, at breakfast, lunch, and supper. Some officers tried to influence them and recommended that they read an article denouncing the Chinese communists in readers I. B. Max Eastman and J. B. Powell. The article in effect said the opposite from what the enlisted men saw in Yan'an with their own eyes, and in this sense, some said it was educational. 
We were military men, not diplomatic personnel, and were unable to cope with responsibilities that required understanding of politics. And our mission, caught in the crossfire, practically deteriorated from demoralization as Yanan and Ambassador Hurley blasted each other in public statements. Our commanding officer was a teetotaler, but he, in his own way, went around to the enlisted men and officers to criticize the Yanan government. He became bitter because the situation got to the point where he felt he was inadequate to deal with problems that required higher level discussions. Quite a few Americans packed their bags, ready to leave Yanan at a moment's notice, either by orders to pull out from General Albert Wedemeyer's headquarters or by request to leave from Yanan's officials. In the meantime, we carried on our duties. Then one day Mao Zedong invited two officers, who were not among those who drank and needled the liaison officers, to his office. Mao told the officers that Yanan would cooperate with us in our military assignments and stressed that if the observer mission faced any obstacles, he would welcome the opportunity to discuss the problems with members of our mission. He replied, in answering a query, that Yanan would not ask us to leave. The officers returned and reported this to our commanding officer, who had noticeably been bypassed. Our mission worked through the office of General Ye Qingying, chief of staff of the communist-led armies. One day General Ye sent me a message, asking me to his headquarters at the foot of a hill across the river from us. He asked me to inform the other members of our mission and General Wedemeyer's headquarters that Yanan would cooperate with us in the war against Japanese militarism, even if our government's policy exclusively backed the Kuomintang. He said also that it was not necessary for our mission to observe their government areas and military forces since overall cooperation between the U.S. and Yan'an had been ruled out. I was also told that Yan'an would no longer recognize our mission officially as a liaison and observer outpost of the U.S. Army China Theater Headquarters. Our commanding officer, I was informed, would not be recognized by Yan'an. If we desired to carry on our work in Yan'an, we would have to deal with its officials and agencies directly, and not through our commanding officer. I returned to our headquarters and informed our commanding officer of what General Ye had said. The commanding officer told me that only General Wedemeyer or a high-ranking officer representing him could smooth out relations with Yan'an. He said we had hit an impasse. While all this went on, we watched with great interest the shipment by air of 20 tons of radio equipment into Yan'an by the OSS. The atmosphere was heavy with suspense as we wondered, and evidently the Yan'an officials wondered too, how the OSS would go about its attempt to install a radio network in Red China. The OSS was tied up in Chongqing with the so-called Gestapo outfit of General Tai Lai, and Yan'an was highly suspicious of OSS operations. The 20 tons of radio equipment was finally stored away in Yan'an's hillside caves. But before all of it arrived, OSS officers began negotiations. Previously, during the honeymoon period, tentative discussions had taken place about OSS operations in North China. But after Hurley's failure in mediation, the situation had changed. Yan'an wanted assurance that no Tai Lai agents would be brought into work as interpreters or agents for OSS communications teams. Furthermore, Yan'an rejected piecemeal cooperation of this sort where the communication network might serve as an espionage and intelligence network for the Kuomintang to be capitalized on in the event of a civil war. OSS negotiators said that after the war Yan'an could have the radio network. This seemed to be inadequate assurance for Yan'an, and its officials insisted that all this be made part of an overall policy talk on a high level. Negotiations dragged and OSS agents brought strong pressure to bear on the Chinese through Yan'an's liaison officers. And as the situation became more hopeless for the OSS agents, they engaged in arguments day in and day out in the caves with the liaison officers. Toward evening and at night, with a few drinks under their belts, the OSS officers would begin sounding off. We could hear their loud voices all over our compound. The OSS agents charged the communists with sabotaging the American war effort. They threatened the liaison officers that OSS guerrillas would fight their way into Yan'an's liberated and guerrilla areas to establish a radio network. You can't do that to us, a liaison officer was heard saying one night. The hell we can't, said a US officer. We're allies. We've got to fight the Japanese enemies, the Chinese said. An OSS officer asked the Chinese if they knew how tough the French resistance force was. The OSS officer spoke of the Macleys who helped the Americans when they landed in Western Europe. They are already in French Indochina, giant-like, tough and with faces covered with beards, the OSS officer explained. Recruited from the French underground, they were imbued with the dare-to-die spirit. One demolition team of four such OSS men, loaded down with mortar, machine gun and light automatic pieces, could outfight a company or even a battalion of communist-led guerrillas. Such a team would be dropped in North China if Yan'an would not allow OSS to put in a radio network, they threatened. Then one dark night an American aircraft took off from Siam, frontier bastion of Chiang Kai-shek facing communist China, and winged its way northward. 
Then, behind Japanese lines and over Yan'an's guerrilla base near Peking, four OSS agents parachuted to Earth. Following this, for about two weeks, not knowing about the airdrop, the OSS officers in Yan'an kept pressuring the Chinese to give the cloak and dagger outfit permission to establish a radio network. The OSS might have to use the French guerrillas, the OSS officers threatened, indicating that force is one language which Yan'an might understand. One morning a liaison officer told me that Yan'an's people's militia had captured an OSS demolition team. When, I asked, more than a week ago, he replied. He said there were four Americans and one Chinese, who admitted after interrogation that he was a Thai Lai agent. I rushed to our commanding officer and discussed the matter with him. Then I informed the OSS officers about their captured team which had been apprehended by armed peasants. Evidently no shots had been fired and no one was injured. I immediately radioed our psychological warfare headquarters in Chongqing to stop dropping leaflets in North China asking the Chinese to rescue downed American airmen until this mess had been straightened out. If the OSS continued to drop its teams, regarded as hostile by the guerrillas, and we dropped our rescue appeal, confusion would result. We might even be accused of bad faith, and legitimately downed pilots might suffer by being held as prisoners. Following this incident, the OSS pulled out of Yan'an. As far as I know, General Wedemeyer's headquarters did not protest the capture of the OSS men, who were held in custody by the Chinese until the war against Japan ended. Shortly after this, civil war broke out south of Yan'an, I remember how sick at heart I was when on the Burma border in 1944. I was told that we who were engaged in psychological warfare were prohibited from giving any hints of encouragement of independence to the Indians, the Burmese and the Siamese, because the British would object. Then in Chongqing, I was told by my superiors not to mention or encourage independence in leaflets we produced and which were dropped from our aircraft over Indochina where the Viet Minh resistance forces were fighting the Japanese. And I was sickened when, toward the end of 1944, I received a package of enlarged OWI photographs showing in detail how the British troops under General Scobie were crushing the Greek resistance forces which had fought the Nazis and defeated them in their region. The war was far from over then, but the British imperialists were crushing the Greek patriots to assure Britain's post-war domination of Greece. I was supposed to exhibit these photographs in North China and to have sets sent out into the guerrilla areas. When some of my superiors saw the photographs, they suggested that I burn them, for the Chinese in North China were fighting like the Greek partisans. They would become suspicious about our war aims, I was told. Months later I recalled all these instances as my commanding officer and I started out from Yan'an on horseback with a radio team and went south from Yan'an to Yadai Mountain, where civil war had broken out. In the end I made the tour myself since the colonel fell off his horse and was injured. Yan'an charged that American arms were being used against its troops by Chiang Kai-shek's forces. It said that the war against Japanese militarism had not ended and U.S. arms should not be used by Chiang in attacking Yan'an's forces. Such arms should be concentrated on the anti-Japanese front, Yan'an insisted. Civil war had started and I wondered if China would have to go through another period of internecine warfare. I wondered whether American arms would be used extensively. The fighting was going on at Yadai Mountain, and on my way there I stopped at a sub-region headquarters of the Communist-led army. A general in command told me that after Chiang's troops had pounded the mountain area with American guns and bazookas, there wasn't a blade of grass standing. At the front, I found Kuomintang troops had overrun communist-held territory. They had been as ruthless to the peasants as the Japanese soldiers. I visited villages Chiang's soldiers had occupied and looted. Whatever they could not haul away on stolen ox carts and pack animals they rendered useless. They had destroyed furniture, large iron kets and quilts. They had mixed corn, wheat and millet with manure to render the grain inedible. Deep water wells of this mountainous region were filled with earth, and precious ropes for drawing water were stolen or cut to pieces. Pigs and chickens had been slaughtered and their entrails stuffed in table and dresser drawers or hung in the cave houses. In a village school the nationalist soldiers had defecated, as they had done elsewhere, and had splashed human excrement on the walls. A young woman, just released by Chiang's soldiers, reported to me that she had been dragged from one blockhouse to another and raped for many days. An old woman past 75 was the only one in a village evacuated by the nationalists just before we arrived. She was sitting, unable to walk, because she, too, had been raped many times. Everywhere on the village walls the Chiang soldiers had written, The Red Army cannot last long, we have American guns. I met hundreds of homeless refugees who demanded that I cross the line of fire to visit their ravaged homes the nationalists were still occupying. They said that as an American it was my responsibility to report everything to my government, which was backing the Chinese government. Go to our village, an old woman begged me. She said the Kuomintang troops would not shoot me since we were backing them and she pointed to my uniform, and the peasants brought me mortar shells and fins marked U.S., they even collected small pieces of shrapnel. 
A village leader said it would take more than a decade for the peasants to recover their losses, and for that many years at least they would not forget America's unfriendly act. I made a detailed report to General Albert Wedemeyer's headquarters. The Chang forces had definitely used U.S. arms. General Wedemeyer came out with a press statement, saying that the arms manufactured in the U.S. had been sent to Chang's government in separate pieces under the Lend-Lease setup. Chongqing arsenals had assembled them and the U.S. had no responsibility about their employment. One of my radio communication non-coms asked me how the hundreds of refugees we had seen would react to such a statement. He was not thinking of hordes, he was thinking of the Chinese peasants as people, no different from him under the skin. When I arrived at Yadai Mountain, on the border of nationalist and communist territory, I found that those in the communist area lived better. While Chang's forces enjoyed an initial victory through a surprise attack, their soldiers at the height of victory were deserting at night and going over to the communist side. I interviewed many of them and found that the peasants whose farms the nationalists looted and occupied told Chiang's soldiers that in the communist-led army, the officers did not ill-treat the men, but were rather like big brothers. The peasants also told the soldiers who had been drafted from the farms that they did not have to pay 50 to 60 percent of their crop to the landlords for use of the land as in Chiang's areas. To me, this behavior of Chiang's soldiers was significant at a time when China was again on the brink of civil war. With such soldiers, Chiang would be routed, even with total U.S. armed support. And the key to Chiang's weakness was in his feudal land system, and the strength of Yan'an lay in the agrarian reform policy. In Yan'an's territory, the tobacco road condition was systematically tackled by government, through reduced land rent with a future objective of giving the land to the tillers, better farming methods and pooling labor power to get maximum production. When I returned from the civil war front, General Chu Te, Chu Enlai, who is the present premier of the People's Republic of China, and General Chen Yi, then the commander of the new 4th Army and now mayor of Shanghai, called on our U.S. Army observation mission. Colonel Ivan D. Eaton and I talked to them. Of the numerous questions Chu Te asked me about my trip, only one or two pertained to U.S. arms. He asked me about the peasants and the refugees in great detail. He told us about the historic struggle of the Chinese peasants to better their status. China, he emphasized, is 80 to 90 percent agricultural. He then asked me to report in detail to my headquarters what I saw in the field. He said through us, we want to ask your government to take back all lend-lease equipment from China, for every bit of it will now be used by Chiang Kai-shek to kill Chinese people. The atom bomb had already been dropped on Hiroshima a couple of days before and the Russian forces had swept down into Manchuria. The Pacific War was over, but for China, the end of the war meant the probable outbreak of a civil war. In the early hours of victory for the Allies, Xu Enlai mapped out for us how the nationalists would attack Yan'an territory. He said U.S. transportation would rush Chiang's troops from the safe rear, where they had been preserved for a civil war, into the Japanese-occupied areas, all surrounded by Yan'an's regular and guerrilla forces. The disposition of Chinese troops at the end of the war revealed how Chiang's and Yan'an's forces had fought the enemy. The major part of Chiang's crack troops were hundreds of miles away from Japanese lines, while Chu Te's soldiers were in contact with Japanese forces almost everywhere in North China and in parts of Central China. To Colonel Yi and, and me, Chu Enlai said, Will you report to your government to take back Lend-Lease to prevent civil war in China? Your country was the arsenal of democracy in this war. America supplied the Allies. But let me remind you it will go down in history that we who fought most consistently and longest against fascism did not get anything from your great arsenal. We fought alone. Colonel Yeaton was a regular army intelligence officer. He had been the military attaché in Moscow, a very important assignment, when Hitler attacked the Soviet Union and the Nazi forces rolled far into Russia. Colonel Yeaton was the officer who reported to Washington that Moscow would fall in no time. He was wrong, and he explained to me that the early gusts of winter came in August that year, and the German soldiers, who had not expected snow so early, were in khaki and were frozen on the vast front. Colonel Yeaton was removed after this and kept in the rank of colonel while younger officers became generals. Finally, he was assigned to Chongqing, and General Wedemeyer sent him to Yan'an just as the war was about to end. Colonel Yeaton wanted to know whether Chu Te knew the Soviet Union was entering the war in early August. One day, for an hour he probed Chu Te. After I returned from the Civil War front, he told me that Chu Te's ignorance was pitiful, and he told me of the great excitement in Yan'an to get political officers and generals, who were there for a conference, out into the field in a hurry after the bombing of Hiroshima and the Russian sweep into Manchuria. They were caught flat-footed, Yeaton said. The Russians had not informed Yan'an. He asked me if I had seen Russian equipment in the field. I showed him empty rifle cartridges of Russian make which had been used by Chiang Kai-shek's troops at Shilai Yuan. I had found the empty shells beside an old woman who had been raped by Chiang's soldiers and who was sitting there because she could not walk. 
The Russians had supplied arms to the central government in the early years of the Sino-Japanese War, but had cut off this supply when Chiang's troops began attacking Yan'an soldiers instead of fighting the Japanese. About this time, the Germans launched their attack on the Soviet Union and the Russians had double reasons for withholding arms supplies from China. Chiang gave nothing, except a few pieces of small arms, to Yan'an's forces from the Russian-supplied military equipment. With civil war imminent, Chiang sent Mao Zedong three invitations, one after another, to visit Chongqing to discuss differences. By Chinese custom, three invitations packed tremendous pressure, and if Mao refused to go to Chongqing, he and not Chiang, it was said, would be blamed for civil war. At that time workers, students and intellectuals in nationalist areas were voicing objections to Chiang's maneuver for civil war. Coincident with Chiang's sending of his third invitation, the Sino-Soviet Pact of Amity was announced. In the treaty, the Soviet Union recognized the central government headed by Chan. In Yan'an, there was widespread fear that Mao might be assassinated while he went to Chongqing. A foreign correspondent in Chongqing asked General Wedemeyer if he would give Mao protection should the communist leader visit Chongqing. General Wedemeyer said no. After long discussions, we were told, the Chinese communist central government decided to send Mao to Chongqing. With these developments, American intelligence officers wondered whether Japanese troops would go over to the Chinese communists in some areas, and thus worsen the civil war crisis. They tried to find out if the Chinese puppet troops who had served the Japanese would surrender to the communist-led forces. At that moment, Chiang was in a weak position, for his crack troops were generally far from the anti-Japanese fronts, being trained by American forces. Unless they were transported into Japanese-occupied areas, which were surrounded by Chu Te's communist-led troops in North China and in vast areas of Central China, Chiang's forces could not accept enemy surrender. How Chiang's forces had laid down in the anti-Japanese militarist war became more glaring by the commands of Chiang and General Chu Te. Xu ordered his soldiers on all fronts to accept surrender of Japanese and puppet troops. Chiang ordered the Japanese and puppet troops to maintain order, meaning to fight off Yan'an's forces. Through radio broadcasts, Chiang appealed to puppets that this was their opportunity to redeem themselves as loyal patriots. On the other hand, Chiang, as the Generalissimo, ordered communist-led forces to remain in their positions until he himself ordered them to move. At that moment in the tense situation, General Douglas MacArthur, as Supreme Allied Commander, designated Chiang to receive surrender in China. General Albert Wedemeyer promised Chiang all our aid to quickly transport his troops into coastal areas of central China and into north China. Overnight this American support swung hundreds of thousands of Japanese troops and an estimated 800,000 puppets, many undoubtedly wavering, to the nationalist side or made them wait the arrival of Chiang's troops. The Japanese began fighting for the Kuomintang in some areas and they were left in strategic spots as anti yanon buffers for nearly half a year. Local Japanese commanders and soldiers, tired of war, asked the Americans to come in and accept their surrender. The situation developed into a mess, and I remember that General Wedemeyer once protested to Chiang that the nationalists were paying the Japanese much more than their own troops. On the diplomatic front, Ambassador Patrick J. Hurley wanted to jump into the Yan'an Chongqing negotiations. We were told that one night at a banquet, he had offered his services to Wang Zhoufei, Yan'an's representative in Chongqing, 14 times in as many different ways. He had been turned down. The ambassador went to General Wedemeyer with his problems. He wanted to know if Yan'an would accept his services of escorting Mao to Chongqing. I was sent to find out whether Yan'an would receive Hurley with due cordiality. Yan'an said Hurley's services would be welcome, although they had reservations about the ambassador's previous conduct, which it felt was biased, unfriendly, and insulting. We asked the ambassador to fly to Yan'an, but we felt that it would be out of step for him to Yahoo, for he had been blasted for being biased and an instigator of civil war in Yan'an. So we waited for Hurley. We carefully prepared an impressive reception for the ambassador. Colonel Ivan D. Eaton, commander of our Yan'an mission, briefed Yan'an's liaison officers with protocol procedure. Mao, for instance, was supposed to meet Hurley first at the airfield and then return to his headquarters. Mao wanted this arrangement. It was planned that Hurley would go to our compound, where he would receive Chu Te and other communist officials. In the evening, Mao would receive Hurley at his headquarters. At the end of August, when Hurley flew in, he was extremely quiet. He was in no mood to exploit his photogenic qualities as he had done about 10 months before. Yahooing was out of the question. After he shook hands with Mao he put his arm around Mao's shoulder like an old friend. He seemed to be trying extremely hard to win Mao's confidence. When we began moving toward our vehicles, Mao started for his old Chevrolet as planned in the program. 
Hurley kept his arm on Mao's shoulders and asked the latter to ride up with him in the jeep. Mao consented. In our mess hall, there was a short reception and tea was served. After the communist leaders had gone back to Yang family's plane, I showed Colonel Yeaton a letter which General Wedemeyer had sent us to be forwarded to Chu Te. This was the general's answer to Chu Te, who had requested President Truman to let his forces receive Japanese surrender in areas where they were in contact with the enemy. General Wedemeyer wrote Chu that in accordance with the Potsdam Agreement, the Generalissimo had been appointed Allied representative to accept surrender in China. Ambassador Hurley read this letter. As he handed it back to me, he said, Young man, don't give that letter to Chu Te until I have Mao on my plane. I was surprised by his statement, for I had understood that he had asked for the privilege of escorting Mao. The ambassador explained that the Sino-Soviet pact which had been concluded had ignored Yan'an and this was a terrible blow to Mao. If you give this letter to Chu Te, he said, Mao would sulk in his corner and not go to Chongqing with him. One blow is all that Mao can take right now, he warned me. He emphasized that Yan'an was backed up against a wall. I came to get Mao and I am going to take him to Chongqing with me. I don't want to drag him, Hurley said. I said this letter from General Wedemeyer would not change Yan'an's decision to send Mao to Chongqing. The communists most probably had not counted on President Truman's support. The ambassador said, Young man, you are mistaken. He then showed me his copy of the Sino-Soviet Pact and told me to read a paragraph which said, In accordance with the spirit of the above treaty and for the implementation of its general ideas and purposes, the Soviet government is ready to render China moral support and assistance with military equipment and other material resources. This support and assistance given fully to the nationalist government as the central government of China. I asked, after reading here and there in the pact, isn't this pledge limited to the war against Japan, since the pact is against Japanese aggression? No, he said. He intimated that Chiang had bought off Stalin with concessions so that the Soviet Union would not aid Yan'an. You see, Hurley said to me, this is a hard blow to the communists. Generalissimo Stalin has promised moral and military support to the central government in any event, even in a civil war. I must show this document to Mao tonight. He showed that he dreaded this task. I felt that the ambassador should know what we already knew. So I told him that the pact had been announced a couple of days before and Mao was familiar with its contents. The ambassador argued that Yan'an could not know the full content of the pact. He said that he and Chan's government had the only complete texts in China. That night when Hurley saw Mao, he offered to leave his copy of the pact in Yan'an. Mao said their radio receiver had monitored the treaty that had come over the press wire. An American correspondent who had flown to Yan'an with Hurley in his dispatch likened Mao's departure to that of a man going to his execution. For Chinese and Americans in Chongqing and Yan'an and elsewhere thought of the probability of Mao's assassination in Chongqing. Before Mao boarded the transport he shook hands with all his comrades. Then he went to his wife, who had their young daughter in her arms. He leaned forward and embraced them both as peasants, while white turbaned nomads with camels from the desert areas, soldiers, students and officials in the hinterland Lois Valley looked on quietly. An American officer standing by me said, they like Mao. He's a great guy with them. I was standing near H. Siu Te Lai, who had been Mao's teacher long ago in a Hunan normal school. Old H. Su had joined the Communist Party at the age of 50. His eyes were damp as he waved his hand at Mao, who stood by the transport's door with Hurley. The ambassador was smiling triumphantly. He was asking Mao to pose with him for photographs. In the days that followed negotiations stalled in Chongqing while Chang's troops were rushed to the Japanese-occupied areas. But what Chang and foreign officials never expected took place. By foot, Yan'an's people, soldiers and civilians by the tens of thousands, raced the nationalist soldiers who were riding modern planes and ships and vehicles into Manchuria. It was really a race between the tortoise and the hare. I believe I will never see again the dramatic and impressive spectacle of thousands of people on the march, the like of which I saw in North China during the months following Japanese capitulation in 1945. This was no parade. Long lines of men, women and children with confident smiles, laughter and song, started out on foot day after day from Yan'an, traveling the dusty road that led to the Yellow River and heading for points from 500 to 1,500 miles away in Manchuria over rugged mountainous terrain. From Hawaii to California is about 24 miles. The sick and old road animals. When it rained, caravans bogged down all the way from Yan'an to the Yellow River. Wet Lois is dangerously slippery, and traveling up and down steep ridges is humanly impossible in rainy weather. And patience was written on the faces of those who waited to start out. One day when I dropped by to see Sanzo Nasaka, who headed the Japanese POW re-education and anti-Japanese militarist psychological warfare program, I saw his secretary pounding dried, cooked beef into powdery form. The secretary told me he was assigned to a newly liberated area hundreds of miles away. With long lines of marchers passing through the same communities day after day, 
he said that the Yan'an officials had asked everyone to carry as many rations as they could. The travelers were not to clean out wayside village stores by buying everything they had for sale, but to consider the day-to-day -day needs of local people. The secretary criticized American transportation by air, sea and land of Chiang Kai-shek's Chongqing forces from south to north China and Manchuria. He said Yan'an should accept Japanese surrender in North China and Manchuria, for her regular and guerrilla forces had fought in those areas. But even with American assistance, Chiang's officials and soldiers can't win the race to take over Japanese-occupied territory. He said, Their people are walking there, I said. The Kuomintang troops are flying and going by sea. Let's make a bet, he said, since the Kuomintang is traveling with American assistance. This is just like the classic tortoise and the hare race. I'll bet on the tortoise and you take the hare. I lost, and I don't recall our deciding on any material thing for a prize after he told me to take the hare. I believe no American in China would have picked the tortoise. The hare, in this instance, did not nap after getting off planes and ships. Top Chongqing officials, as in one case I know from personal experience, asked for a swanky residence and a car as soon as they arrived in an area like Peking. Eight confiscated Japanese trucks in a medium-sized central Chinatown disappeared in a few days after Chiang's officials arrived. The black market thrived, and Chiang's soldiers had to fight the local people in North China, just as the Dutch, with British help, tried to get back into Indonesia. Chiang's soldiers also looted and further estranged the people. Coordinated with the long 1,500-mile trek to Manchuria from inland China, Yan'an's troops and civilians on the coast moved northward also. The new 4th Army abandoned the taking of Nanking and Shanghai, evidently because U.S. armed forces made it known that they were going to move into those cities. One Yan'an official said his people did not want to clash with the Americans. When Yan'an's troops and civilian officials raced northward from Cheking province, crossing the Hangzhou Bay and skirting United States and Kuomintang held Shanghai, many American officials and GIs, out of curiosity, went to see them. Students from Shanghai rushed out to join them, 